Up next, we celebrate one of America's foremost troubadours. He ruled radio from the 80s into the 90s with an uncompromising vision of what life is like for the rest of us. We honor his legacy with his top five songs from the 80s. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny Eyewear. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Join our community to travel back with us to the greatest era, the rock and roll era, every single day. Just subscribe below, hit the bell so you never miss out on our content to help us curate this virtual music museum. Be a part of our mission to help this history. Check out our Patreon link below, that helps us a lot. It's time for another episode of our show, Vox. We celebrate the greatest vocalists of the rock and roll era. Now in this episode of Vox, we celebrate the great John Mellencamp. Man, Billboard magazine called him the most important roots rocker of his generation. Johnny Cash called him one of the 10 best songwriters in music. John was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2008, Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2018, and he holds the record for the solo artist with the most songs hitting number one on the mainstream rock chart, reaching the top, no joke, seven times. Not bad for a Hoosier who uh, used to run around Bloomington, Indiana, singing and, and playing his guitar bare-chested and shoeless. True story, Shoeless John. Anyway, seriously, when you examine the life of John Mellencamp, you can clearly see the roots of his superstar success. They're found in a, a tenacious fighting spirit that he displayed the second that he left his mother's womb, really. His bold determination to return to those roots fueled his artistic liberation, or restored his birthright. John Mellencamp was born in the small rural town of Seymour, Indiana. At the time of his birth in 51, the population of Seymour was less than 16,000. As an infant, he battled spina bifida, which is a very debilitating affliction where the spine isn't fully formed. Infants suffering from spina bifida generally don't live very long. Baby John had to undergo corrective surgery to prevent against potential paralysis and to save his life. Four infants uh, underwent surgery for spina bifida at the same hospital during the time of John's operation. John was the only patient that survived. The other three babies sadly didn't make it. That's a pretty heavy thought. It reminds me of Elvis's twin brother that died at birth. I mean, does it give the survivor a uh, responsibility to achieve greatness? Maybe do something of greater consequence for others? Definitely something to ponder. During his college years at Vincennes University in Indiana, Mellencamp fronted a glitter rock band called Trash, it was named after the song by the New York Dolls. His day job, uh, while he was making his way through school, was installing telephones. Now, after two years at Vincennes, John traveled to New York City because he wanted to check out the Art Students League to follow his passion for painting. And he used to drop off demo tapes at the offices of, of artist managers and A&R people in the city with aspirations of landing a recording deal in the music business. Now, people in the New York City music scene called him a hillbilly from Indiana. It's a label that he didn't mind because, as Mellencamp proudly admitted, he was a hillbilly, very good-natured. The first industry pro, though, to believe in John was his first manager, Tony DeFries, who invented and forced the stage name Johnny Cougar upon his young client, slapping it on Mellencamp's debut album, Chestnut Street Incident, in 1976. Uh, unbeknownst to Mellencamp, you know, John certainly had respect for DeFreeze, who managed David Bowie at the time in 75, but he hated the name Johnny Cougar, can't blame him, and he pushed back mightily. After all, no one had ever even called him Johnny. But DeFreeze told him that he had to roll with it, or they wouldn't release the album, not giving him much of a choice at all, really. John's gradual ascent increased his leverage, though, uh, his leverage with his record company, and he used that power to eventually get his name back. It was an evolutionary process over many years. Johnny Cougar became John Cougar, and then John Cougar Mellencamp, and then finally, the man the music business called a hillbilly got rid of the Cougar moniker permanently, and he went back to being just good old John Mellencamp. Ironically though, by 1987, there was a very strict mandate at Polygram Records that if you referred to Mellencamp as John Cougar, or John Cougar Mellencamp, you would be fired. Uh, the music found on the first eight John Mellencamp studio albums 
They really incorporated elements of the artists that influenced him the most. You know, there was Woody Guthrie, Bob Dylan, James Brown, and the Stones. However, his ninth album, The Lonesome Jubilee, was 100% Mellencamp devoid of the influence of the artists that inspired his earlier work. He had hit that point in his career where he identified the music that he felt truly defined him artistically, and he had full creative autonomy without record label interference to, to blur his, his vision or stifle his integrity. Mellencamp began to incorporate more roots rock instrumentation, you know, such as the dulcimer, uh, the mandolin, fiddle, accordion, dobro, and the penny whistle on his albums, which has influenced countless folk and country and Americana artists for the last, I don't know, 30, 35 years. In addition to returning to his roots, though, musically, John Mellencamp wanted to use his fame to give back to the community that raised him. In 1985, John joined forces with Willie Nelson and Neil Young to create Farm Aid, an annual charity concert that created, uh, was created to really raise awareness and funds for American farms and the families that operate them. Since the inaugural event in 85, Farm Aid has become an annual institution that's raised millions of dollars for U.S. family farmers. Having said that, here is my John Mellencamp, 80s fiber. Gonna start with the 80s. Um, we'll cover other parts of John's career down the road. It's just too hard to come up with five over his brilliant career. Now, first, before we do that, I wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Wear these all the time. Love their style, and I love that I can customize them, and I get it at a price lower than the vinyl record that I bought last week. If you click on the link below, you can design your own pair, put something on the side, choose any color, check that out. Now I'm gonna start with an honorable mention, Cherry Bomb, the second single release of his 1987 album, Lonesome Jubilee, has become a classic. So much to love about this track. I mean, the heart pumping nostalgia of longing for the good old days, you know, outside the club, Cherry Bomb, when a sport was a sport and dancing meant everything. Dancing everything. The song's tender introspection at the end is something that I've thought of, uh, about a lot lately. You know, 17 turned 35. I'm surprised that we're still living. If we've done any harm, I hope that we're forgiven. The wonderful placement of that accordion that just blankets the song with a charming melodic sentiment. It's a very cool touch that was one of those bold moves by John Mellencamp that defied record industry conventionalism. Cherry Bomb was a number one track on the mainstream rock chart and number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. Number five, ROCK and the USA, the rousing tribute that Mellencamp subtitled a salute to 60s rock. The chanting, nostalgic uh, rocker, narrating the arrival of American rock, paying homage to the artists that took risks and pioneered the road for future generations of musicians to follow. Mellencamp wrote about being educated while he listened to the variety of styles played on the hometown AM radio stations growing up in the 1960s. Multiracial and multi-genre references are just rampant throughout the tune with shout outs specifically sent out to Frankie Lyman, Jackie Wilson, Bobby Fuller, Martha Reeves, Young Rascals, Mitch Ryder, and of course, the great James Brown. I've had the opportunity to ask about half of those artists in interviews about that shadow, what it meant to them. And we're gonna share that down the road. We're gonna do a special segment on this song. It's just one of my favorites ever. Actually, R.L.C.K. in the USA was a departure from the overall theme of the Scarecrow album, but it ultimately fits because R.O.C.K. in the USA is a celebratory anthem that's honoring music that shaped John Mellencamp into the person that he is today. Mellencamp really said it best when he stated that he felt really lucky to have grown up listening to the kind of music that was blared over the airwaves during the golden era of American pop. Man, 50s through the 90s, amazing. You can really feel the pride and the passion and the reverence that Mellencamp has for this music. He applauds uh, in his energizing vocals on ROCK in the USA and his backing band flat out kills it. Again, we're gonna cover this song in detail very soon. 
RLCK in the USA was a biggie. It was number two on the Billboard Hot 100, number six on the Top Rock Tracks chart, and number seven in Canada. The Kiwis in New Zealand loved RLCK in the USA. The song actually went all the way to number one in that country. Number four, the second single from the 1983 album, uh-huh, Pink Houses. You know, like Springsteen's song Born in the USA, the meaning of Pink Houses was misconstrued by the public who thought that it was a rah-rah song about the red, white, and blue, but it wasn't. Um, John Mellencamp actually wrote Pink Houses about the destruction, the decay of that great idea that this country was really founded upon, the American dream. He believed that it wasn't coming true for most people, and in a sense, he was right. That sobering reality is best captured in the second verse of Pink Houses. Well, there's a young man in a t-shirt listening to a rock and roll station. He's got greasy hair, greasy smile. He says, Lord, this must be my destination. Greasy smile, he says, Lord, this must be my destination. Because they told me when I was younger, saying, boy, you're going to be president. But just like everything else, those old crazy dreams just kind of came and went. We've all felt that way. But just like everything else, those old crazy dreams. Now, John got the idea for Pink Houses while he was driving through Indianapolis on Interstate 65. He, uh, he noticed a black man sitting in a, a rickety chair on the lawn in front of a dilapidated pink house. Mellencamp wondered, is that what life leads to? Then John thought, what if the man is actually happy and doesn't feel the world owes him anything? Who am I to judge this guy's feelings? You know, it's an interesting perspective, and the song was what Mellencamp called a creative breakthrough for him. It led to more compositions about his personal observations of struggles, real human struggle, and experiences of real people. John Mellencamp once said that he wished that he would have spent more time on the third verse, and that's always just boggled my mind because I think it's perfect. In my opinion, maybe one of the best final verses in a song from, from that era. The American dream really laid bare. Well, there's people and more people. What do they know, no, no? People. What do they know, no, no? Go to work in some high rise and vacation down at the Gulf of Mexico. And there's winners and there's losers, but they ain't no big deal. Cause the simple man baby pays for thrills, the bills, the pills, the kill. Now, I don't know exactly what Mellencamp was trying to convey there. So this is my take on it. I think he's talking about the intangibles that we face on the way to following our dreams. You know, Leonard Cohen wrote, uh, everybody knows that the fight is fixed and the poor stay poor and the rich get rich. That's how it goes. But unlike Leonard Cohen's bleak outlook, John Mellencamp gives us some hope when he says that there's winners and there's losers, but they ain't no big deal because the simple man pays for thrills the bills and pills that kill. It's the workers who keep America going, you know, working their fingers to the bone to put food on the table and the sacrifices made, good and bad, that get us through. Some people might work in, in some high rise to make more money, go on fancy vacations, but what do they really know? When there's a, a man uh, sitting with his cat on the porch of his low-income pink house with an interstate that's running through his yard, he's totally happy, totally content, thinks he's got it made. When he dies, you know, he and the rich man leave this world the exact same way, no material possessions. This song just makes me think about my dad, the hardest worker I've ever known. He was a painting contractor. He died younger than he should have. You know, his body was bruised and broken from the work that he, he accomplished every single day. And he wasn't wealthy, a wealthy man in terms of money, but like that, that black man with his pink house, he, he was happy. He had an entire community that just adored him, loved him. He always provided for us. He's the main reason I am who I am. And I treasure the values that he taught me. And to me, that's what John Mellencamp has always stood for. The everyday heroes that put their best foot forward and lead this world a better place than the way that they found it. Man. Pink Houses went to number three on the mainstream rock chart in 83, rose to number eight on the Billboard Hot 100, and number 15 in Canada. Number three from 1985, Small Town. 
was another top 10 smash from Scarecrow as the album's second single, climbing to number two on the Top Rock Tracks chart and number six on the Billboard Hot 100. John Mellencamp was born in Indiana, as we said, and John swears he will die in Indiana. He was proud of where he came from, and he had no desire to be anywhere else. One of the endearing parts of a small town is the warmth and affection that, that he projects on the track about the value of family and staying close to good friends. It's a song that has it's always filled my heart. Growing up in a small town of Blackfoot, Idaho in the 80s was the greatest childhood anyone could ever wish for. I fought against it in my late teens and left the second that I graduated and through my 20s, even my 30s. I wanted to be in the city, but as John Mellencamp says so eloquently in the song, I cannot forget where it is that I come from. Cannot forget the people who love me. And now I've moved my family back to a small town. I want my kids to have that treasured experience and nothing gives me greater pride than saying I was born in a small town. Now John Mellencamp wrote Small Town to make a statement countering the music industry mentality that you, you had to live on the coast, you know, New York City or LA to be happy. Small Town reflected on conversations that he had with people in the music business that you know, John Mellencamp found to be uppity and condescending. John had a little stutter in his speech and a rural, almost country Midwest accent. People in the music business told him that he talked funny. The speech may have been stammered, but the language in his music was fluid and authentic. That's why it connected with people on such an emotional level. Those with a deep pride in their community know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I was born in a small town. Along with the boss is my hometown. Small town is, is one of the greatest depictions of rural America ever captured in song. John was writing from his heart. We could all sense it and feel it. Gonna die in a small town on a probably where they bury me. Number two, Little Diddy about Jack and Diane. Man, Mellencamp's number one pop smash from the American Fool LP in 1982 now, the song was originally written about a mixed race couple, a white girl with a black guy. It was not about a teenage couple growing up in the heartland. The original line Jackie gonna be a football star. is actually Jack is an African American. But the record company executives did not care for the song's subject matter and demanded that John change the theme of Jack and Diane. Ridiculous, but uh, anyway. He ended up changing the Jack character of the song to be a football star. Now, recording Jack and Diane was more like uh, a little bugger than a little ditty. Actually, the problem was how to turn a folk song into a big budget record that would just burst out of the speakers and ignite people. Turns out that In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins would provide the sonic template to make it possible. Mellencamp came to the recording studio and played In the Air Tonight telling his producer and collaborator, Don Gemmon, that, his, that uh, that was the sound that he wanted to create. A little folk song that segues into big, bombastic drums and guitar licks that will take the song to a whole new place. That's what he wanted. The idea was all well and good, but they still didn't know how to get the sound uh, that John Mellencamp desired. Gemmon then had the idea to get with the Bee Gees, whom he had worked with and borrowed their extremely rare Lynn drum machine at that time, gave it to drummer Kenny Arnoff to program a steady beat for the first half of the song. Then they brought in Mick Ronson from David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust, and he showed them how to use the gated echo effect that Hugh Padgham had used on In the Air Tonight. Ronson continued to take lead on putting almost the entire arrangement together for Jack and Diane from there, including uh, singing, you know, let it rock, let it roll, that part, evoking the sound of a choir. So let it rock. The song was shaping up finally, but actually the label hated it. Crazy. John's band and production team pleaded with him to keep the pressure on the label to include the song on the American Fool album. It's crazy that they wouldn't know that was a hit. Man, the label executives were really high and hurt so good and hand to hold on to, but they didn't give Jack and Diane a chance in hell. John kept fighting 
And, and uh, his belief in the track prevailed, becoming the second single from American Fool and his lone number one pop single. Was, it stayed at the top of the charts for four weeks. John Mellencamp had a love-hate relationship with Jack and Diane over the years. Um, he's proud that he wrote it, but not more proud of it because it went to number one. The older the song gets and uh, the more it has transcended to younger generations, the more John Mellencamp has come around to appreciating its enduring quality. Jack and Diane will be taking on a uh, whole new life pretty soon as John has announced his plans to co-write a stage musical inspired by the two American kids growing up in the heartland. Pretty much inevitable, really. Um, that he characterized in that little ditty clear back in 1982. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. And number one, check it out. The third single from the Lonesome Jubilee came out in 87. Now, peaked at only number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100, but it's the Mellencam song that really hits me right to the core. As a young boy, I was a bit of an old soul, and Check It Out made me grow up even faster. Check It Out is a song that just stimulates so much contemplation and reflection about uh, your life. And it begs the universal question, what have we learned about living? Consider these poignant lyrics, so check it out. Where does our time go? Got a brand new house in escrow. Sleeping with your back to your loved one is all that we've learned about happiness. Man, that is deep, especially for a 10 year old kid. There's hope in Mel and Cam's Check It Out uh, that the next generation finds what truly makes them happy rather than you know, following a formula of the American dream that's been pushed on them, being disillusioned when it doesn't look exactly what we've seen on TV. I love that. I love the final lyrics, a million young poets screaming out their words. Maybe someday those words will be heard. future generations riding on the highways that we built, maybe they'll have a better understanding. Of course, that's repeated many times and ending with hope they have a better understanding. It always it chokes me up at the end there. Hope they have a better understanding. The arrangement in Check It Out is rich with, with soulful and pure musicality. There's nothing synthetic or computerized about Check It Out. And that just bolsters the song's cerebral uh, stimulation. The prominence of the violins, accordions, it just creates an Appalachian sound that harkens to original country music. It reminds me of how important real musicianship is, how much it contributes to the emotional power of a song. Those elements that make a song timeless um, and meaningful, like a, like a classic painting that increases in value and potency over generations of perspective and discovery. A song like Check It Out gives me invaluable nurturing. I love that whenever I need something to inspire me, I can just simply play Check It Out, and I have a million times, and my spirit is just vigorously fulfilled. John Mellencamp has always written about the, the American experience in deeply thoughtful, poignant, and honest ways. To me, he's captured our deepest fears, but our greatest hopes with just powerful discernment. It always disappointed me um, when critics would compare John Mellencamp to Bruce Springsteen and say that he was like a lesser version. Boy, were they wrong. I mean, I would guess that they never truly listened to John Mellencamp beyond the, the catchiest parts of Jack and Diane or Hurt So Good and just made a, a swift judgment. There's so many songs that John has written that are etched in stone on the walls of the New World America. Songs like the ones I've mentioned, along with you know, Rain on the Scarecrow, Paper and Fire, The Real Life, Human Wheels, Now More Than Ever, and so many more. Over the last half century, John Mellencamp has more than proved that he is shoulder to shoulder with, with Bruce Springsteen, Bob Seger, John Fogarty, Johnny Cash, Billy Joel, and of course, Bob Dylan, as the latter-day poets, the modern voices of the American tradition, keeping the flame alive that was originally sparked by you know, Walt Walt Whitman, Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, Woody Guthrie, Hank Williams, and Sylvia Plath, and a few others. I wholeheartedly agree with Johnny Cash and so many others that have given John Mellencamp effusive praise for his lyricism. Thank you, John, for staying true to yourself and sharing those heartfelt stories that have enriched our lives and taught us something about living. Yeah. 
Leave us a comment about John Mellencamp, your memories, and your fiber. To get John's music and merch, click on the links below. If you love our content or if it resonates with you, we'd love you to subscribe. You can be a part of our mission of curating the greatest of the rock era, a literal museum on YouTube. Just click on the Patreon link. Check out the Zenny link as well to customize your own pair of glasses. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe out there.